Hi everyone, I'm Chris Ryan, founder of Masters of Photography. I hope you're all staying as safe and as well as you can out there during these times. Welcome to our free stream show. Um, we're going to bring on some masters of photography to tell us about what they're up to during these times and maybe set some projects, tell us about what they're doing, uh, have some Q&A with them. We'll be showing some clips and some of their imagery just to help inspire you guys and to keep you creative during these times. So without further ado, let's bring on our first master. Photography is really a tool for us to go out into the world and find bits and pieces and moments and objects and people and places and time and light. Everything is photographable. So come with me and let's see what we can discover. So it gives me great pleasure to bring in our master photographer, and a very good friend of mine, Mr. Joel Meyerowitz. Joel, how are you doing, buddy? <laughs> Hi, Chris. I'm doing like everybody else is doing. I'm uh, sheltering at home and trying to do things that keep me interested and engaged. Do a lot of cooking. I do a lot of photographing. I do not as much reading as normally. But, you know, these times require us to adapt and become better at being ourselves We're, without so much interaction with other people yeah we realize how much we need people yeah, it's true um and, and you know obviously being creative in these times is, is so important to, to to all of us you know to how do we do that and how do we keep how do we keep that creative vibe going you know and um i'd love to talk to you a little bit later about what you're actually doing at the moment you know but do, do you miss that mass in the streets i know you love to photograph in the streets and are you missing that vibe at the moment? Yeah, you know, I, being alive in the world and out in the street and watching the craziness of humanity on a daily basis has, has been the way I've lived most of my life. And so I really miss that. And I, I miss the, the energy, human energy that every hive that we live in, because we are creatures in hives, aren't we? Isn't that what cities really are? I mean, we see it now when when you go out on the street and there's no one there. Yeah, it's true. Um, and But I think I remember uh, Andre Cortez, for example, you know, it, it, he holed up in his apartment. Um, I think he had a, a he had a bereavement. And, and also then I think I believe he was sort of attacked in the streets and he holed up in his apartment, almost isolated himself. Um, and he created some incredible pictures. And, and I believe actually you, you, you met him during that period, didn't you? Yeah, when, you know, toward the end of his life, when I was working on Bystander, the history of street photography with Cody Westerbeck, we went down to see Andre two or three times because he was he was sort of um, amusing, charming, grumpy, cantankerous, <laughs> you know, bitchy. <laughs> he he was up he was up and down. I think he probably felt that he didn't have the kind of renown and recognition that he felt his work deserved. And meanwhile, he was getting all the recognition that anybody could ever hope for. I, I have a funny story. We went to see Andre. He lived in Greenwich Village. And his apartment looked out, he had, a, he had a terrace, and it looked out and down into a, a, a park with a big fountain in the middle and a, and a kind of you know, an NYU university around it. And uh, it gave him a wonderful advantage. He could work with a telephoto lens and look out of his windows and down onto the street. And, and he made really e extraordinary photographs, both from his apartment out and then within the confines of his apartment. But on one of the days we were there, um, we were talking and Andre said, oh, oh, you must come outside to see the, the view from the balcony. And on the way out, I noticed on a little side table where he had some objects stored, there was a fried egg. You know, one of those rubberized yeah, fried eggs. Yeah. A perfectly made one, the kind you'd love for an English breakfast. <laughs> and. And I, 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 as I walked by, I picked it up and I, I, we came outside and I said, Andre, 
you, you left your breakfast on, on the table. And he said, oh, and he picked an egg up and he slapped it <laughs> right on his forehead. And he stood there with his egg. And of course, I had my Leica with me. And I went, tch, 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 made like three instant pictures of Andre with egg on his face. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that image up right now. Uh, it's hilarious. Yeah. So it, it it's true, but but it, so he didn't feel the confinement, right? I mean, he he didn't feel um, he didn't feel that it inhibited him to a certain extent. He created those beautiful pictures of the two little glass um, sculptures, which I, I think probably was reminiscent of sort of him and his wife. I, 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 so he he used that confinement. He he used the light. He used the the dynamics of the room to create imagery, even though he was in some sort of kind of self isolation himself. You know, it, during the, the, 16, uh, the 1606 bubonic plague, all the theatres closed, all the shops closed, everyone was in isolation. And a certain William Shakespeare decided that that was a really great time to like, look at his intro of stuff he should finish. <laughs> and he actually wrote King Lear, Macbeth, and some people say Antony and Cla Cleopatra during the lockdown, you know, in 1606. So... It does open opportunities. And, uh, and so I'd love to talk to you now about kind of your project, which I know you're doing. Um, if we could talk a little bit about uh, the project that you're currently doing uh, at home and have done from January 1. Well, you know, on January 1st, when I was here in London, I thought, what could I do for 2020? Such a nice number. And maybe I could find a project for myself. I mean, things come along all the time that are distractions from whatever project one has, but it's good to have something going into a year that gives you a kind of concentration. And I thought I've never done self portraits. I mean, in my lifetime, a few here and there, usually with an eight by 10 inch camera or my Leica once in a while, but I've never done it in any consistent, steady day by day way. And I thought, well, I'll challenge myself because we live in the time of the selfie and it's not something that I do, you know, yeah. I, yeah. almost ever. I don't take a picture of myself, but I thought photographically, how can I make this interesting and challenging? So, you know, the first few pictures I made on, on January 1st and 2nd were pictures of me, you know, holding the camera out at arm's length, trying to get myself in the frame in an interesting way. And then I realized I had a little, one of those tiny tripods that's about, you know, five or six inches tall. It's kind, I think kind of that, bendy legs, bend, ones with bendy yeah, legs. I'm, yeah, I'm bendy legs, right. Uh, but, but not a gorilla pod, oh. just a, a small, but like a little gorilla pod. And, and um, so I set that camera up and then I realized, oh, wait a second. The Leica has a 12 second timer. So I set the camera on 12 seconds and then I was able to actually go about in my space living the moment rather than posing the moment. And then the camera makes a picture when it's ready to and catches me off balance in some way, unawares, out of the posy position. Almost like having a, uh, a second person in the room doing a documentary about me and they choose to take a picture when they see something interesting. That's sort of the mindset of it. So I've made 90, I've made 120 days of portraits every single day, inside, outside, shaving, bathtub, you know, cooking, making soup, flipping an omelet. It seems to me that you started on January the 1st and this set of images will have this extraordinary arc from, from what was going on in the world January the 1st through to what you're going through now and, and a lot of the world is going through now and hopefully coming out the other side of it later in the year. So, so not, only, um, you know, not only is it a brilliant idea, but it will have this arc and, and that must be fascinating for you to, to, to explore because I've seen some of them uh, earlier on, which are sort of more social ones where you're at dinner table with friends. And now a lot of your images uh, in this project are, are singular or just with Maggie and you. Yeah, well, you know, you, you can plan, but you can't plan the outcome. Yeah. And so by planning to do this for a year, I, I opened myself up to all kinds of challenges and play. But then suddenly 
we're into lockdown and and the 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 portraiture continues but it's now continuing inside of a predetermined space that gets very familiar very fast so i have to try to be more inventive within the confines of my home I have to look at different things you know i'll tell you for instance yesterday afternoon um maggie was was running around the house vacuuming the house it was just one of those moments she felt, oh, got a vacuum now. She does this every two or three days. So this <laughs> place is, it's sparkling. It doesn't really need to be. But she was vacuuming. I had just come in from the studio part of the house. And I picked up my camera. And then I noticed I could see her in the mirror. And so I moved myself into the mirror. And I started to make a picture of myself. But of course, she was so far away that she was out of focus. So... I thought, well, how am I going to make this picture interesting? So I made a, a, a few frames of myself in the mirror where I'm in focus, and then I moved the focus so that she was in focus, and I was out of focus. And I thought, oh, given today's capacities of Photoshop, I can take these two pictures and blend them together, yes. and I can yes. counteract the limitations of photography and take an out-of-focus zone and bring it into focus by layering the two pictures. Hmm. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. What I see is it's using photographic intelligence and our capacities today. Most people will look at it and they'll just see me in the corner of the frame and they'll see Maggie in the distance vacuum and they won't think why is that why are they both in focus? Yes. So yes. so in, in a way, these kinds of photographic technical challenges come into play. It's, yeah. it's interesting to recognize certain limitations and, and problems and then try to solve them photographically, just like you would when you're out in nature, working with your, your position in space or the timing of people in a picture or whatever it is. And I use this same time exposure trick, not a trick, it's my, it's, it's my asset. Yeah. I use it in nature, too, so it allows me to set the camera up somewhere on the street or on Hampstead Heath. I put it down on the sidewalk or even in, in, this, in, in the street where the traffic is, yeah. and then I go stand on the other side, and I can literally fire the camera with my the, the WAN uh, release that the Leica has now. I could use my phone to set the camera off. So in, in a way, I have a new kind of control, and it allows me to do things at a distance and risk making pictures of me far away. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's completely different, perhaps, to the way that um, you, you've worked in the past, you know, where you, where you will specifically select you know, that 250th of a second, that 250th slice of what's in your viewfinder. And now you're you're using the timer to create things in a in a sort of a, almost a random way, um, and and you're enjoying that 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 massive change. Well, you know, I think anything photographic that, that challenges the way we think about making pictures is a, is a game changer. And and we're in a moment now where the whole game has changed, our life game has changed, and so working with inside that box. It's like those Russian egg boxes, you know, one thing inside of another. Yes. Yes. Working with inside of that, it's, it poses interesting and playful challenges. And I have to say, I, I come away from a lot of these shoots that I do about myself really laughing <laughs> at how ridiculous an idea it is and yet how interesting. Yes. And, you know, if you focus on it with your mind so that you see the the photographic potentials and after all for the whole career that i've 50 plus years i've been photographing i've always been asking questions about what can i do photographically that's interesting whether it's still life or street photography or landscape or or you know shooting from a moving car i like the challenges and so this self-portrait challenge has is so much bigger than you would think of to begin. You know, it's not just a selfie. And by the way, I think the most important thing for me is that my ego is out of the picture. Okay, yeah. 
Understand. I'm not trying to look my best. Yes. I'm trying yes. to make an interesting photograph of the most ordinary, commonplace, daily life rituals, and then set the camera so that it sees me doing it in real time without me trying to look my best. And, and that is the, the most interesting challenge of self-portraiture, right? To not idealize yourself so that you look good to your your history, audience, family, whatever. Yes. You look like the schmuck that you really are. <laughs> Absolutely right. And your, your image is beautifully portray that and, and you are you know you are capturing dynamics you know you, you're finding the dynamics even in confinement you're, you're finding the dynamics in a room you're finding the dynamics in the light you're finding definitely finding the dynamics in your angle and then you're bringing into them intimacy and loneliness in some of the pictures and as you say you know they represent all of those things and in the social ones you know joy as well and so it's a, it's an, a beautiful arc already of, of how you see the world and your world in confinement and outside of confinement earlier on. So, I, and I just wondered, if, is there you know, anything that um, you can uh, uh, give to advice to, to photographers who are sheltering now in terms of uh, you know, what advice to give them about what they might be looking to try and create? Well, you know, it does seem on the one hand that it's limited. Everybody's going to say, I'm sitting in my apartment and this, I, I'm, it's so familiar, there's nothing fresh to see. And that is the lie that should inspire some kind of creativity. Because really, if you look around your apartment, there are so many ways to actually see the place you've been living in, in a fresh way. For instance, you could say to yourself, I'm only going to follow the light. I live here, but I, and I'm so used to the space and the proportions and the, you know, the mess that one lives in or the pristine quality one lives in. But I'm going to make light my subject, which means you have a chance to sit in any part of your house and watch the way either a beam of sunlight comes in and hits the floor where there's a red rug and the light bounces up on the tan couch and turns the bottom half of the couch red, or it turns a wall green, or, you know, it's, it's like a, a billiard table. Light caroms off all kinds of surfaces and leaves a drawing of itself, yes. a yes. color drawing of itself, or a volume drawing of itself, a band of light. So I would say to people, to, to just inspire yourself, go and watch the way light changes the course of the, the sculptural qualities of your rooms or the objects in your rooms. Or you can take objects, books off the bookshelf, shoes out of the closet, boxes of things that you never use. You can take all the oddball stuff that does not constitute beauty People think when they make a still life, they have to get apples and pears and oranges and make a beautiful, conventional, classical, renaissance still life. Bullshit. You don't need to do that. You can take anything that interests you. You could say, oh, look, I'm, uh, this is my wife's desk, her, her drawing. I'm working on her desk today. Here is this, this jar with some things in it. And she's got lots of lots of things around that are just the objects that she uses to draw with. You could pick up those things and see, ask yourself, how do I make a still life out of objects that don't have essential beauty, but they may have interesting shape or color. They may be dinged and dented and kind of throwaway stuff that you've never been able to part with because it's had some kind of meaning for you, an old baseball glove, an old soccer ball, an old, you know, who knows what, a bunch of hats that you have that have been lying in the bottom of the closet in a sack that you've meant to give away or throw away. You can take these things out and just move them around on the table. But I, I agree, you know, let, let's inspire people to look around them at home and, um, and see what they can use and how they can use it. And create imagery, you know, and, and 
if you create something interesting, upload it to our photo stream on our site and, and, and put a hashtag on it, you know, Joel one, and we'll take a look and see what people create. Sure. And we can, you know, we give some feedback. Yeah, too. exactly. That would be great. Um, okay. Thanks, Joel. I, I just want to bring in one of your students uh, from your masterclass who's got a couple of questions. So over to you, uh, Richard. Uh, Richard, uh, Joel, Joel, it, Richard. Good to see you, Richard. I hope you're doing well during this time. Well, well I'm great. Thanks, Joel. And, and thanks so much for doing this, uh, this, this conversation. It's great to see you. Uh, Joel, I wanted to, to start off by talking about um, still life, because in these circumstances, many of us are, uh, are forced back to it, maybe exploring still life more than we might have done otherwise. And one of the questions I had uh, looking at the, the segments on still life in your course, really, was how you elevate something from simply being a picture of texture and shape. You, you talk about doing things intuitively a lot, but, you know, there are seems to me the best still lives have a resonance that goes beyond simply what the, the subject is. And I wondered if that's something that, that you think about when you're putting still life together or if it just happens or is it maybe just in the eye of the beholder? That's an incredibly astute question. And, and I think the, the answer is subtle in the sense that each of us as an individual has responses to things. When, when you're in a, a fruit and vegetable market, for example, and you're going to pick apples, you don't just reach in probably and take five apples and just throw them in the bag. You pick up the apple and say, oh, this one's dented. I don't, I don't want that one. This one's got a blemish on it. This one's, you know, its shape isn't appealing to me. I mean, at least I do that. Maybe everybody does. I don't know. But when you pick up each of those objects, whatever they are, and you turn them around in your hand, you're examining them for the, the, their shape, their appeal to you, their eye appeal, their color. You know, I, I think we make a lot of very subtle, intuitive, aesthetic decisions for everything. So if we take that further, and we, we talk about objects in a still life, and you look around your house to say, well, what, I want to make a still life, but I don't want to make a conventional still life, such as Renaissance still lifes or Dutch still lifes with beautiful fruit, and, and you know, occasionally a fly on the painted on the fruit. I, I want to work with whatever I have. And so you, you pick up your objects, and, you know, one of them will will just look like nothing to you. So you'll put it aside and another and another. And then finally, you hold something in your hand and you turn it around and you realize it has an anomaly in it. It's got a, a dented surface or it's been aged in a certain way or heat has burnished it so that its, it's coppery color has gone black and something. Something about the object gives it character or persona. And, and, in that moment, I recognize individuality in the object, and I, I take it in and I think, oh yeah, this means something to me. I don't know what yet, but it obviously has a calling. It's calling out to be seen. So if I could gather a number of these objects and slowly turn them until I find the facet of the object that gives me an expression, even if it's an, an object as, as simple as, as you know, a, um, a ceramic vase. It, this one does not actually have perfection. This shoulder is higher than this shoulder. And so as I turn the vase around, I think, aha, uh -huh, that side is speaking to me. And, and that to me is the, the Zen bell of uh, inspiration. When an object reveals uh, a, a special quality, a characteristic, it is then talking to you because only you recognize that special characteristic then. Mm -hmm. it's not, you're not holding it up to an audience and saying, which side of this should I shoot? You're feeling something inside. And I believe it's true with everything. You might look at, you know, um, look in your larder. For things and and see what the boxes look like in the cabinet after they've been opened and the ziploc is gone and they've been crumpled or crunched suddenly they become characters 
in a little still life play. Because, you know, a still life is like a stage, right? You're setting the stage out, you're putting the characters on the stage. And what happens between the characters? But I, I think you have to let go of the idea of beauty initially, because I think that comes with the idea of still life equals beauty. I don't think so. I think in this case, finding the energies that a number of objects project onto each other when you assemble them together. Because, you know, you can cluster three or four together like this, and then you put two over here, and, and they're talking to this, this group here. So suddenly, there's a, a living dynamic that is your creation. Looking at the Polaroids Andre Kotesh took towards the end of his life, and I remember you saying you visited him in his apartment in New York, it must have been 40 years ago, or, or maybe more, I don't know. No, less, less, actually. Yeah, in, in the, it was in the 90s. Oh, in the 90s, okay. But those little Polaroids that he took, very simple photographs, but they are kind of exquisite, and, it, and they, they speak in a way that actually most of us going around taking a few shots around our homes are never going to manage, going to approach. And therefore, you know, the question raises, how does an, an artist like a Tesh manage to get that extra dimension? And is that just a natural intuitive thing if you are gifted? Or is it something that you, you stage manage in the way that, that you know, a, a theater producer would? Um, Fair. It's, I think it's an incredibly important question to ask because many of us deny our creative range. You know, we say, ah, you know, I, I don't know what to do with that. But, but Cortez was poetic. He recognized the poetry in things, the oddball character of them, the, the, the sweet uh, memory that one of them projected when he picked it, up, picked it up. He was the kind of man who held on to things. And, and I think if you allow the, the trance state to enter your consciousness when you're looking at objects, instead of demanding that something come to you and be great, if you're willing to look at the, at the slight, impoverished little thing off to the side, you know, and, and uh, here, here, here's a tiny box on Maggie's desk, and on the box there's a little drawing or writing that she had made, and the box is, uh, you know, a hexagon. And, and then inside there's... There's something in, inside. So, but you could get lost in this box. Cortez would get lost in this box. He would take that Polaroid camera and he'd move the box around on the windowsill until it maybe it made a very long shadow. So he would see the relationship between box, funny shape, shadow, mm -hmm. windowsill, window with a kind of dustiness on it, blurry outside world he was able to fantasize and go into this trance of the object having a kind of radiant energy. And I think that all of us are capable of these poetic transformations, but we don't always tap into it. We, we want the object to be complete in and of itself, but the object needs us to recognize in it some mystery, some potentiality for revelation. And, and you know, mystery, revelation, potentiality. Listen to my language. I mean, I, I'm not planning this. This is me talking because I'm a dreamer too, just like Andre, but in my own way. And so I can get lost when I pick these things up. It's as if a kind of a kind of connection occurs that is so much deeper than I would have anticipated that I'm surprised by it. And the surprise draws me to go further in to examining this thing and time disappears. I'm lost in the moment. And you know, photography is about the moment. Yeah, and yeah. yet the moment can be an extension of time while we're wandering around in it until we find the the place that speaks to us and we can press the button and, and have a kind of equation between us and it. Does that, does that make sense? It, it, it does. Can, can I take that idea out into 
the street, as it were, in street photography, because um, obviously there's been an explosion. Street photography at the moment is incredibly fashionable. If I'm going to be brutally frank, I see an awful lot of rather routine and derivative street photography online and around the place. And I, and I wonder, that's a, a challenge, I guess, of people trying, trying to find their own voice, trying to find you know, an original take, trying to find a fresh response, which I think is more difficult, arguably, at a time when we are saturated in imagery uh, all around us all the time. Uh, have you got anything to, to, to say about how do, you, how do you find something fresh to say when we're inundated with other things and that a lot of people are trying to develop their own style and their own voice and start off perhaps by imitating, you know, the masters, but struggle to get beyond imitation into something fresh to say? Yes, I mean, I think it's the, it's the eternal problem. There are always the, the great mass of people who can easily imitate or, or try on the approaches of other people. Painting, sculpture, dance, photography, film, you know, there always are imitators. How does one find one's own voice? It requires a kind of listening to your impulses and your instincts and your intuition, all that internal stuff that is your engine of creativity. And, and I think learning to trust that is the, the task of every, per, every single person who wants to be an individual artist rather than a follower. It's so easy to follow. You know, after Picasso and Brock uh, sort of created the cubist ideology, it was easy for people to come in and start fracturing everything, you know, with lines and showing different facets of it. And, and you know, they were just imitators. The two or three inventors of cubism are the, the ones who rose above it all, because by the time everybody else was copying, they already had moved on to the next phase of their lives. So I, I think for if someone is passionate about street photography because they like being out on the street in the world at large, they have to find what it is that excites them precisely not look for a Gary Winogrand or look for a Lee Friedlander or look for a Joel Meyerowitz, or not look to find what they think those people might have made, but to look for what is the moment? What is the interaction between people? What is the, the scope of the space that life is taking place in that's yours? And those little, those little riffs give you a sense of, of traction. You say, ah, ah, I keep coming back to this thing of tiny people in very big urban spaces, showing how humanity is dwarfed in that space. I keep wanting to step further and further back. If you recognize your tendencies, if you recognize your appetite, in a sense, you'll begin to make pictures that have only your fingerprint on them. Not on the negative, <laughs> not on the print, but on your your vision. And I can tell you that it happened that way for me. At different steps along my path, an idea refreshed itself in my mind in such a way that it was I could not negate it. The idea had a kind of sim simple power, and it seemed to call me more loudly than everything else. And, and when that arrived and I started to do it, I poured myself into it and I didn't, you know, friends of mine would look at it and say, well, it, 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 everything's too far away. I, I don't get it, you know. I'm, and I thought, well, screw you, you don't get it. I, I get it and I'm just going to keep working on it until I make it strong enough that you will get it. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a way you need your individuality. That's very good. I, I wonder if talking through that, and, and Richard, please, please stay with us um, on, on the line please. there. Um, I'd love you to just talk to a little bit about um, your still live projects that, that we covered in, in the masterclass, which are um, you, the work you did in Tuscany, for example. You know, um, you did talk a little bit about the interaction and, and the conversations between objects. But perhaps we could talk a little bit about your Suzanne and Mirandi work, Joel, and how that came about. 
Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I really never made still lives. Probably in my life, less than 10. And most of those were found still lives. Like we get up from the dinner table after 10 people had dinner. And before you clear it up, you look around the table and every glass has a little ruby of wine left in the bottom. And there are plates with forks and knives and napkins. And the whole table suddenly was the, the manifestation of 10 people's hands moving things around. And it looked beautiful. So that's the kind of still lives I made where I never touched anything. And then one day, uh, I was working on a book project uh, on, on uh, Provence. I went to Aix-en-Provence, where Cezanne's studio was. And as an old art historian and a painter myself, I wanted to go to Cezanne's studio. And I went in, and I was shocked that the entire studio, which was really huge, it had one wall of windows that must have been... I don't know, 20 plus feet wide by 16 feet tall. It was a gigantic window and the room was filled with light, but the walls were painted a dark gray. And I thought, what? Why did Cezanne paint these walls gray? I mean, today's studios and museums are all white boxes, right? White cubes. Yeah. And so I thought, well, Cezanne was sort of the, the first modern artist, you know, at the very end of the 19th century into the 20th century. He was doing things that were unlike the conventional reproduct- representation of deep space. He was nullifying deep space by making things in the distance and things on the, up close, just little patches of paint that he, that he put near each other. It wasn't about trying to make an illusion. And as I looked around the room, I noticed that he had on a shelf above his walls dozens of objects that he, I recognized them from his still lives. And I thought, why? And, and I, I, I asked the woman who was the, running the place if I could take down some of those objects <laughs> and put them on Cezanne <laughs> because they were, they were junk. Did I mean, she, but they, did she say you're, you're completely crazy or did she say, okay? Well, I had to say, I'm Joel Meyer with Look Me Up on the Internet. Yeah. I'm doing a book. You know, I had a, I had a, I had a line. Okay. Anyway, she let me. And I spent an afternoon photographing these objects against the gray wall because I was trying to see, simply, how did they influence the space that Cezanne was working in? Did it allow him to move from the surface of the object when he was painting it to the background without having to create a deep space? Did that gray function as a flattening element in his visual uh, recognition of space? Anyway, that was the, the, um, the argument I pursued in doing this. But when I got home to my studio, and I looked at all the pictures and I blew some of them up and I printed them right away. I had a big printer with me in, in Provence. I suddenly saw their simplicity and I, and, I, and, and I had turned each object around as I was telling Richard before, mm. looking for the, the anima, the spirit in the object. And I thought, Cezanne must have done that too. Why would he just put it down randomly? He was the kind of guy that would turn it until he found a part that spoke to him. Anyway, that drew me into still lives in a very simple way. And then step by step, I moved from the rendition of a single object on a flat plane near a background into more complex relationships and changing the background. I built a box for myself that was sort of an an angular box. I, I took a piece of 19th century fabric and I, I printed an image on it, a dark, dark image that you really can hardly see except now and then it looks like a variation. And, and so I made, I made different kinds of backdrops for myself that allowed the objects to live in the space, to vibrate in the space, to interact with each other in the space something that gives them 
a dialogue mm-hmm. or or some kind of conversational thing so that I can engage. And I have to I have to tell you, this is funny. Because <laughs> we were speaking of the street, Richard. Yeah. One day I was pushing these objects around. I must have had probably 12 to 15 objects on the table, very crowded. And I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to move them around as if I was on the street. And they were street life, coming down the street and someone's coming up the street and they're going to they're going to separate. They're going to separate that phalanx of people because you have to move to the side. So I started to make a street energy appear on the work surface. Now, that was just like a flicker of an idea that popped into my mind. So what do you do when that happens as a photographer? Whether wherever you're working, do you cancel the idea and say, no, I'm not doing it? Or do you say, hmm, that's interesting. Why don't I just play with that? Because it's all play. Mm-hmm. I think of it as play. Yeah. And, yeah. and we need that. I mean, we always hear artists talking about playing like children. Well, they're not kidding. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you lose your negativity, which is always trying to refine, I can't do this, and I shouldn't do that, and I won't do this, and this, is, this doesn't work. You're left with sort of nothing. Mm. Well, it's true. And, and the intensity I find in still life, I've been a still life photographer for 30 years, you know, the, the, the intensity of those small objects, moving them around, the, the concentration and, and the way you can lose yourself in the messages and the, and the, and the aspects of that work is, is really amazing and, and incredibly interesting. Uh, if you've never tried still life or, you know, think, ah, no, it's too dull, Try it, right, Joel? I mean, you know, if you can get caught up in it and spend a half an hour, 45 minutes in play, particularly now during lockdown, you will be engaging the the inner recesses of your mind with the factual reality of the present moment with objects that you've chosen to work with. And ideas will definitely spring up on their own. You'll have frustrations and you'll have resistance, but you'll also have potential optimism. Things will suggest themselves. And it's the opening of the suggestibility space in each of our characters that allows for creativity. I don't think creativity is a rubber stamp that you get when you're when you're born. They project this one's creative. Boom. <laughs> you have to recognize creative. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You have to recognize the the inner workings of y- your your potential, mm-hmm. your playful. Pot- I call it playful potential because yeah, yeah. often when I'm when I'm stumped by something, and and I'm looking at it, I just wait with it, and I think, what else? What else? I get up and I move around, or I move it around. I try to engage because if you don't engage, you don't engage, right? Yep. That's the end of it. No art. That, that's uh, absolutely right. And I think art that, is an engagement that is full of risk and and unpredictability. You find that the the you have to work it. So the first few shots you take of any setup are rarely the best. It's the ones you take twenty minutes into working it that that, that somehow you get you know, beyond the obvious shots and you get into something else. And it's always the ones that are you've worked away at for a little while, 10, 15, 20 minutes or whatever, that turn out to be the better ones in, in my experience. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think there's, these two things coexist, Richard. There's the first impulse, you know, first thought, best thought. Yeah. But then there is the pragmatic side of pushing and pushing until the unknown, because that, that was easy to, in a sense, to recognize. The harder stuff, might give you more pleasure because you've earned it, you've worked it through. You decided, you just, you had this thing, and, 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 and you had this thing, and at some point you thought, am I going to be able to balance this thing on this? And you work, and you try, and you try, and it doesn't do it, it keeps falling over, and then for one moment you think, oh, I'm going to go get a piece of that gum, that chewing gum. I'm going to stick it on there, and I'm going to put this on here, and I'm going to balance this thing. And it works. And suddenly, you can't breathe, because you've got to make the picture before it falls off. <laughs> and, the, and the wonder of the picture is that you got it to balance in the first place. And frankly, I do that a lot 
with these objects that I found in, in France and in Italy, I sometimes make a kind, like, like a few years ago, I had to, I was commissioned to shoot a, a whole pavilion, to create a pavilion for the Milan Expo World's Fair. And I had the grain pavilion, pavilion. And so I got bread from all over Italy. Hundreds of loaves of bread were sent to me from all over Italy. They arrived by chauffeur-driven limousine, they arrived <laughs> by mail, they arrived by, you know, people asked people to do it, to, to deliver it for me. I had bread everywhere. Tiny breads, gigantic breads, round breads, flat breads, thin breads. And I had to photograph them all. And after a while, I started to see that I could balance one of these very thin pieces of bread that was, you know, like, like this, but rigid. And I could stand it up and I could lean something across the top and it would touch the wall. And I could put, I had so much fun playing with the breads and their shapes that I got completely lost. And, and I, I made hundreds of photographs as if I was doing portraits of these personaggi. Yeah. You know, that's what yeah. they'd say in Italian. No, that's a personaggi. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you get engaged, time disappears and the, the sense of play and the vitality of the objects come into a new way of relating to you. And, and I think it's an expression. It's a, it's a, it's a moment of self-expression. And, and, that, and that's it, really. That's what art or instinct brings us to. And it's, it works for photography perfectly because you just press the button on instinct and it makes a photograph. So, Joel, what we're going to do now is um, show a clip uh, from the, the lesson that we filmed with you in your studio in Tuscany, in the barn there, uh, which was amazing. So um, just four minutes of uh, uh, part of the lesson uh, in Tuscany coming up now. Composition, that's a word that sends chills down my spine. People talk about composition as if there are rules for how you make a good composition. And I say, throw those rules out. To me, there are no rules for anything. The only rule probably is when you go out, carry a camera and make sure you have film or a chip in it. That's the only rule, but that's just basic Boy Scout preparation. But for a composition, for a, a still life, or a portrait, or anything, I say, and it served me well for 50 years or more, make it interesting. Push things around so the frame is alive. Don't be, don't be too precious. It's so easy to say, oh, if I, if I move this, uh, you know, I'll lose the composition. If you really feel concerned about where you put your objects. Take a pencil and make a little drawing around the bottom of the object so you knew that the square thing was here and the round thing was here and the bowl was here. You know, the, the great Italian painter Morandi did that on his table. If you look at my Morandi book of still lifes, you'll see that he drew thousands of little circles on his table to show where his positions were. But it also showed how flexible he was and how he, he could move his objects around in any relationship he wanted. So I, I think that it's all play. You put an object down, the first object, and maybe you just make a portrait of it. And you find where it reveals itself most fully and where do you see it most strongly? Where do you connect to it? And then maybe you add another object. And it's possible that they start to have a conversation. Maybe it's about one is big and one is small. Or perhaps it's about one is black and one is red. So, and you'll choose other objects to come into the game. It's like you're the coach and you're bringing in the players so that 
they'll play the game well for you. I'm not kidding when I say this. This is a, a kind of childlike activity, making a still life. And how sweet it is when you bring these objects together, and after a while you discover their, their energies, their conversational um, approach to seeing each other or being with each other. And you'll be surprised that you can say things with these objects that you didn't know was on your mind. But the objects themselves kind of tickle you, or they kind of suggest something. And so you think to yourself, oh, I'll just put them closer together here. And then you look in the camera and you think, ah, that's interesting. And if I add a little something over here, bing! So it's, it's a game. And, and as I say, there are no rules, so what can I teach you? I can't give you any rules, but I'd like to be able to give you the confidence to play with a kind of open-heartedness and a willingness to surprise yourself at the things you choose and how they bring meaning, really, some kind of significance or poetry or even drama to the, to the little world you're making on a tabletop or the floor or the hood of your car or, I mean, anything can be a still life and any place can be the background for it. So just move them around in the light, add light or boost light or darken the area. It's in total control and it only comes to you when you have a sense of play. Okay, so this is the In Isolation question number one. If you could only have one camera and one lens with you in isolation, what would that camera be and what would that lens be? This is not a desert island, that's isolation, right? It's in isolation, yeah. <laughs> We don't want to get sued by the BBC by calling it Desert Island Discs or something. Mm -hmm. I would have a 35 millimeter Leica camera with a 35 millimeter lens. An analog 35 film camera? Uh, no, I, I uh, isolation means you probably won't be able to go out and get the film, which less and less of it is, exists anyway. I would need a camera that I could recharge and um, you know, keep working with my chips and the like. So yeah, I, and the, you know, the 35 millimeter Leica is my tool of choice. It's an old friend. It has wonderful rendition. It, it a 35 millimeter lens is my one-to-one -one yes. lens. It shows me the world as what I see is what I get. Uh, it's my go-to. Fantastic. Okay. Right, you can take one other photographic object with you in your isolation. You can have with you in your isolation one other piece of equipment or photographic object. Um, what, what would that be? It would be uh, an HP 44-inch printer. Nice. That's a good one. That's what I would do because that's what I print on and it is the most reliable color quality it, you know it, it has uh, ways of balancing internally that whatever you see on the screen you get so I, it's it's my it's it gives me the proof of whatever it is I make and that way I could complete the circle I would have the picture and I would have a proof of it so that I I would learn to work with it further or it would be you know got it it's got proof Great stuff. Okay. So um, you can have with you, if you could only have two books, and one of the books was a photography book and one of them was a non-photography book. Um, what, would, what would your two books be? What would your photographic book be, first of all? My photographic book would be Looking at Photographs by John Sharkovsky. Ah, yes. It's 100 photographs 
and 100 brief essays from the Museum of Modern Art's permanent collection. Um, it is one of those books that I've read. I've read those 100 essays. I can't even count times. 20 would be too little. You know, I go to that book whenever I need a little pick-me-up sometimes, a little, or I'm trying to um, refresh some way of thinking about th something. I go and I look at John's writings and, and his selections, and it rekindles my passion for the medium and my understanding of, of that. It's a great, a great book and a great choice. So then I have to ask you, I'm afraid, you know, this difficult question as well, in isolation, if you could only have one non-photography book, um, what, would, what would you choose? There's a, I mean, you know, that's a really hard question. Yeah. But Sorry. I've, uh, over, over the course of my life, I found that mythology, Greek mythology, has been very supportive in helping me to understand human behavior. The certain, some truths that they um, understood back then in the simplest of times, human truths, have played out in the, in, through the expression of mythology and hold true even to today. Mm -hmm. So it would be uh, one of the I, I'm just reading a, a book now, actually, um, called, I think it's called Mythos. And it's a kind of a fresh interpretation of those myths. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm finding it so enchanting. And it's, it's, its tone is a contemporary voice, but it leans heavily on the original myths and it takes them apart in ways that are so playful and, mm. and charming. Interesting. And it's so it's something that you can, on many, many levels, it would keep you entertained for a long time because it, it's opening more questions and ideas about the myths. That's uh, very interesting. Yeah. Well, it's human nature, you know, and, and the way they shaped it using gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things I, I, I have no idea what, what's true or not, but I've always thought that the gods were not old men and women they're like teenagers oh yeah they're so capricious yes and they don't give a shit for anything they'll turn you into a stag or a tree yeah. or a stone yeah. in a split second they don't give a shit <laughs> and and and, there's, and and they have you know momentary uh, uh, passions and i think of course the the, the gods were were youth itself mm. unfolding and 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 trying everything and challenging everything and so, you know, submitting to their passions. And the telling of those stories um, gives us insight into the way human nature works. At great. least that's what I think. So I think yeah, great. those two things are two storytelling books yeah. that yeah. would, that enliven the mind. That's great. Well, that, that's a great answer there. So if in isolation, if you could only have one luxury item what would it be please Joel <laughs> are you going to say you're going to say Harrods I, right Harrods you're going to say I, Harrods I know you are <laughs> Harrods the whole store <laughs> Bloomingdale's <laughs> you know I gosh it's really, it's a, it's a terrible. I tell you, the first thing that springs to mind, and okay, I know that's it. That's it, what we need. It's ridiculous, and it's not even such a luxury, but in, in a sense, it is. It's. Uh, I just bought a, a wonderful mandolin, a Japanese mandolin slicer. Oh yeah. Because I like to cook mm -hmm. now in isolation, mm -hmm. and the mandolin does things to vegetables and stuff yeah. that are yeah. so playful. Yes. And and so much fun to use and. Um, I, I just found that it's expanded my repertoire, ah, you know, good. five fold right now. Yeah. 
And I look forward to every day to mandolining something new. I've, oh. I've been a recipient of your mandolining and I can, I can tell you it's well worth it. It's wonderful. I love it. So, <laughs> that's great. Thank it's you. Kind of uh, if you were not uh, in your own profession, this is my, another question. I've only got two more, by the way. If you are not a photographer, what other profession would you have liked to have been involved in or, or, or to have been? And what profession? Well, there are two. Okay. Do I have to limit it to one? Mm, well, I'm being very generous today. I'll let you have two. Okay. Well, I, uh, a dancer. Wow. Okay. I would have... I, I, my father urged me to learn to dance when I was young. And I, you know, I thought poorly of it because we were living in a tough neighborhood. And if, if my buddies saw me going off to ballet school or something, it would have been hell. Okay. You know, but I did then learn to dance, and I love to dance, and I, and I, and I and dance. But I think, um, I think I, for a long time, I had wanted to be a filmmaker. And, you know, I made one film, but yes, pop sto storytelling and and the the movement of the camera and lighting and and chance and combining it with music and sound and voice, the layered um, richness of cinema would be something that. I would have done. I wanted to be a filmmaker before I was a photographer. Me too. When I was an art director, and as a young man, I, I, I was looking all over New York to find a film company that I could work for. I would do anything to be in film, but nothing, I, nothing showed up, and I, and I stumbled on photography. So. Yeah, me too. Same, exactly the same. I, you know, from nine years old, I wanted to be a filmmaker, and then when I was twelve years old, I wanted to be a photographer. And that's pretty much all I've ever done since. But uh, no, great, great answer. So finally, uh, last question in isolation. Um, what turns you on spiritually, creatively and emotionally? Well, actually, the pause that we're all living in is a, an expansive spiritual moment. Uh, in that there's a lot to reconsider about the way we all have lived. But personally, how have I lived? What have I tried to maintain that was part of our social construct? And what can I let go of? And so, particularly at my age, you know, and having this crisis come toward the end of one's life is a real, real game changer. And so... I, I think it has um, raised really spiritual questions for me. And out of that focus comes the questions about creativity and what was the third? Emotionally. What? Emotionally. Emo emotionally, yeah. Well, they are all unified um, conditions, I think, uh, interlocking conditions. and and. I find that by um, opening myself to this pause spiritually and what this means for my life right now uh, brings me to a uh, fresh kind of understanding of the creativity of the moment, the playfulness, the necessity of playfulness right now, and, and um, managing the emotional ups and downs of being in isolation, finding the joy in it, and the, the, the continued pleasure, the underlying you know, construct of what it's like I, I, to be alive now and to have to put up with this. You know, we're fortunate. We can all go out and go shopping and take a walk. But what must it be like for people, you know, the, the Nelson Mandela's of this world who were big mind and they were in confinement in a prison cell in isolation yes. in solitary for a long, long, long time, yeah. and around yeah. them was the kind of violence of, of the prison. We're fortunate. This is nothing compared to people who live in those things. So I'm trying to use this time to stay optimistic and open-hearted and creative and helpful. And uh, you know, I really think what we're doing here today is part of a very helpful, 
outreach on all of our parts. Thank you, Richard, for being part of this. Thank and, you, Richard. And Thank Chris you, Richard. For, for stimulating this as a uh, as an offering to uh, our public, yeah. for other yeah. photographers. Well, that's right. Thank you, Joel, so much um, for that. And thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you for coming on, Joel. And uh, we'll get this out to as many people as we can and, and just help to talk about photography and talk about what we're all doing in, this, in these moments. Thank you both very, very much. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. As always, Joel, talking to you. And thank you very much, Richard. Uh, and I, I would encourage um, everyone to, to, to try some still life and to upload it to our site and, and put the hashtag uh, on it, uh, to put the photo stream on Masters of Photography site and put the hashtag on it, you know, Joel One. And uh, we'll see, you know, uh, let's encourage everyone to go out and try some still life. Richard, are you gonna do a still life for us? Yeah, I'll do one, yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, I can see from what's behind you, Richard, you got plenty of stuff to work with. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about the mess of my study, yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, well, that's about it for this show. Thanks for tuning in and watching and stay safe out there. Stay well out there. We'll see you on the next one in about a week's time. Watch out for announcements on our website and on our social media, mastersof.photography. Thanks a lot, guys. See you later. <laughs>